good evening. Welcome to Calvary. It's glad to have you worshiping with us this Wednesday night uh, as we do our, our Bible study and time of prayer. Uh, good to have Marcella back with us again. This is week two for her uh, after a double lung transplant and being uh, medically quarantined uh, all through COVID just to protect that uh, those new lungs. And so she's been released to be with us. So good to, ha good to have her here tonight. Uh, Beth and Brian's probably on their countdown with us as they uh, prepare to move to Kentucky someday. Um, they're doing what Alice and I are doing. They're doing the two home thing. I went from having one messy house to having two messy houses this week. And so uh, one of these days, one or the other will get clean, but probably never both. So at least one will get sold. Uh, uh, hopefully. So y'all pray for us. We're in the midst of the move process. Well, the moves, I guess, happen. We're in the midst of reestablishing house at the new place. And so a lot of, a uh, lot of chaos in my life this week. So, um, did just send out a prayer list right before service, six o'clock ish. And, uh, um, uh, mostly because I've been busy doing the move stuff and I forgot about it. And so wanted to get some updates out there to you. So I'll talk you through the updates I've got. Uh, and then uh, we'll take any new requests we have. If you want to make new requests on Facebook, uh, Tim will read them out to me. So go ahead and type those in and he'll get them to me as soon as he sees them. And uh, we'll get those mentioned as well. Um, talked to Sharon Gibson's, uh, about her mother-in-law. Uh, Sharon Gibson about her mother-in-law this afternoon. Uh, who's still in the hospital. Uh, they have been denied twice uh, movement to the AMG floor, the third floor of Hancock, for uh, longer term care. And so they're looking at possibly Morristown Manor again, which is where she was prior to this round of hospital. And so uh, keep them in your prayers as they make those uh, decisions. Wanda Hampton is at Morristown Manor. She is actually able to have visitors at Morristown Manor, she told me today. Um, they're doing physical therapy on her uh, following the rods in her hip. And so she says she's doing pretty good. Had a little bit of pain yesterday. They had to stop the therapy because of that. But today's been a good day. And so good spirits and doing good. Um, John Freeman is at Community North Rehab. Uh, his daughter will be meeting with his therapy team tomorrow. So we'll know more then. I think physically he's improving uh, quite a bit, but he's still having some speech issues. Um, no issues eating, which is also a good thing, um, or swallowing. So uh, John's making progress, but we need to keep John in our prayers. If anybody would like to minister to John and Anita, they need their yard mode. And so uh, this week, if we, have a, if we have a dry day, if not when we have a dry day, down in New Pal. That would be helpful. So John doesn't come home. Think he's got to uh, mow his yard. Um, so if somebody's interested or willing. Let me know. And uh, we will get them ministered to in that way. Just a little something that we that we can do to, to help out. Um, I have not uh, heard an update on Miss Dottie. Since she, other than she did make it to Florida. She is uh, settling into her house. The kids are telling her to go slowly. Uh, but I don't know if she's listening. Polly? Well, good deal. So her kids have helped her get unpacked and moved in. and we, uh, So she's doing well. So keep Dottie in your prayers. She's got some... Uh, upcoming health tests or exams and uh, those kind of things. So I uh, just pray that everything will go go well there uh, as she uh, gets settled into Florida. Mention Brian and Beth. Um, they've got a house now in Kentucky, a house in Indiana, which means they've got a lot of work ahead of them. So keep them in your prayers as well as they uh, uh, begin this transition to be close to grandbaby and, and Micah. And they're taking Malachi. So... Uh, and a few cats, I think. Kentucky will inherit a few cats. Uh, all right. I think those are my, my updates. If I miss somebody, let me know, and I'll, I'll tell you what I know. What do you all know? 
Tim, verify that you're that they're getting sound too. Make sure I'm not muted. Okay, thank you. I just thought about that. Here I am, ten minutes in. That's happened to me before that I've hit mute on my mic and didn't realize it. Uh, additional prayer requests. Um, yeah, so national or internationally, we need to be in prayer for India. There's just uh, a lot of uh, COVID deaths, a lot of COVID uh, spread. Uh, they've really been hit hard last couple of weeks, and a lot of uh, relief agencies are trying to set up shop, and infrastructure's not good. Um, just a, a whole lot of problems. So uh, pray for those who are giving care, for those who need care. Uh, of course, uh, when, it, when it comes to, to our missions opportunities, um, what a mission opportunity for our Christian workers who are there to give aid, but also to give uh, Christ as they, as they give aid. So a lot of opportunities uh, in the midst of that. Um, things in our community and seem to be going well. And so we, we're thankful for that. We praise, praise the Lord and just ask for continued good health and low numbers and all those kinds of things. How about other praises? Marcella. <laughs> yes. Wow. Very good. Yeah. So cataract surgery, that was a big success. I'm going to tell you the way I interpreted what you said. I look good tonight. No. <laughs> She's talking about how clear and crisp everything is. And uh, you don't realize how bad your vision is until you get it fixed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was watching the end of uh, Wizard of Oz the other night. Got home, turned on the TV, and um, it was it was the end. And remember what the uh, wizard says to the uh, to win? Uh, not what's her name? Dorothy and and the guys as as the dog opens up the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. He's not there. <laughs> oh, start us off with a good laugh. Any other praises? All right. Well, join me as we pray. And then uh, we're going to start something new tonight. Father God, I do thank you. I thank you for the group that's gathered here in your house. I thank you for those who, who join us virtually online. Um, we just ask your many blessings on each of our prayer requests and prayer needs. Lord, we lift up uh, to you um, each of these. Uh, you, you know the specifics. But Lord, we will also lift up to you the, the need of salvation. The need of growing in Christ to become more like you. We lift up to you the, uh, the desire of our heart to know you and to make you known. And if that's not the desire of our heart, help it to become the desire of our heart. Father, we ask you to forgive us when we failed you. To cleanse us of unrighteousness. To restore us to holiness. To guide us uh, so that we know the direction we must walk. The path that we must travel. Give us vision to see and to understand your will for our lives. How to minister to those around us. And how to share Jesus. We thank you for opportunities that you place before us. Um, vacation Bible school. Student camps this summer. Um, just our weekly services and Sunday school. Lord as well as just going up and down the road. Going to work. Going to the store. Whatever it may be. Help us to be kingdom minded. Kingdom focused. 
Desiring your will be done, not our own. Desiring that the lost would be saved and the saved would be sanctified. Yeah, we know there's a lot of physical needs, but Lord, we most often shortchange the spiritual. So Lord, we, we, we lift that up tonight to you. That you would help us grow in our faith and help us to help others. Father, we also lift up our world. Um, it's not just COVID, it's sin. It's, it's pagan beliefs. It's uh, worldviews that deny you. And so Lord, we ask that you would guide this world back towards you. Help us to know where we are, where we've been, and where we need to go. Again, we, we pray for the sick and the hurting, the, those, those who are struggling in India, especially with COVID. But Lord, most important, that you'd be glorified, that people would see you and accept you and follow you. Be with our missionaries as they plant those seeds and water them. Father, it's our prayer that you would harvest. Have a great harvest. Help us not to forget the prayer of Luke 10 too, That the Lord of the harvest would send harvesters into the field. May we be those harvesters. And may we be part of praying for those who will harvest. Lord, be with our Bible study tonight. As we open your word, remind us of the foundation that it is. And the need we have to know you better every day. But also to live out the truths of the gospel. Help us to live for you. Without shame, without fear. With courage. We ask this in Jesus name. Amen. Well, we're going to start new tonight. I mentioned last week we started a new study. We're going to be in the book of James. James chapter 1 tonight. We won't cover the whole chapter, I don't think. Uh, we'll kind of going back to the way we used to do things before COVID. And so those of you online may not uh, may miss some of the congregational input as we as we talk through some of these verses. Uh, I will repeat some of what's said. I probably won't try to repeat everything that's said. Um, I hope this will be more interactive. I know I've asked questions each week, but I intend this uh, to be a little more interactive where we're learning together. That's my goal. Um, and so we invite you to, to be with us, and we hope this blesses you as well. Uh, but just know there may be times and weeks where I spend more time interacting with the people in the room and you may not hear everything that they say or that's said. Um, that's uh, unfortunately the nature of the beast in, in what we're doing and how we're, how we're trying to, to do this. Uh, I will say this also. You're invited to be here in person. We've got, oh, what, seven, about 10 to 15 people here on a given Wednesday night. Which means there's a whole lot of space to social distance. Uh, you're welcome to wear a mask if you want to. You can sit a long ways away from everybody. and um, we, we love you. We will accept you as you come. And uh, so if you want to be here in person, there is a place for you. We have uh, Marcella with us. And uh, um, her doctor told her she could come to our least attended service, which is Wednesday night. And so I'm inviting you. You can come to our least attended service uh, on Wednesday night. We'd love to have you in person. It goes from 630 to 730. More often than not, I'm done by 7.32. Can't promise to get done on time, but I try to get done close to on time on Wednesday night. So, uh, uh, praise band starts as soon as I get finished. So, uh, uh, you're welcome to come. We'd love to have you. Look forward to seeing you. But also thankful to have you online. All that said, starting in the book of James. Who wrote the book of James? Or James did. Polly gets a gold star. Um, in my in my introduction to the book of James in my Bible, it says James wrote the book of James. The problem is there's at least three, if not more, potential candidates. One highly more likely than the other two, and commonly accepted to be the author of the book of James. First one would be James, the brother of John, but he died in the early 40s. The book of James was probably written just after that, and so probably not the brother of John. He was martyred too early for this book. Another is uh, um, James, let's see, son of Alphaeus, mentioned in Mark chapter 3. But none of the traditional uh, scholars have ever referred to him as the author of the book. Uh, no early writings suggest that it was him. 
And so evidence just doesn't support that as a claim. The third and most likely candidate is James, the brother of Jesus. Absolutely. James was not a believer early on in his life. He was not a follower of Jesus when Jesus was alive in his earthly ministry. But shortly after his death, where we have references in Acts um, and in, in, in uh, um, I believe it's Second Corinthians. I have to go back and look. Um, First Corinthians uh, that uh, uh, he was a, he became a follower of Christ. We believe he is the author of this book. We do know from the historical record that he was heavily involved in the church in Jerusalem and a strong leader and advocate advocate in that church. And so most likely the book of James, written by Jesus' brother. Which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, you ever know somebody, a family situation where uh, siblings were at odds until one of them died? And the living sibling took on the characteristics of the sibling who, who passed away? Even though they were at odds in life. But the death drew them into that. Uh, we kind of see that here with James. Um, he's drawn into the character, the nature of Jesus. He's carrying on his brother's mission and doing it with great zeal and passion and I believe true faith. Um, and so, writes this book. What is the theme of the book of James? What's the general idea? How to live your faith. How to be a Christian. What's the, what is the uh, negative critique that comes from Martin Luther? About the book of James. Martin Luther didn't like the book of James. He thought it should be cast out. He said it was too much works based. The book of James has an assumption at the front end of it. So we'll see this in verse, verses 1 and 2. When we, uh, verse 1 when we look at the, uh, the greeting. Um, there's an assumption that James is writing to believers. Prim his primary audience is believers. As believers, he doesn't need to share salvation with them. And so there's, a, there's an underlying uh, piece of information that makes James palatable to people who feel like there's, there, there's uh, too much works and not enough grace or not enough uh, um, um, salvation by faith aspect to this. And that assumption or that under, underlying truth is he's writing to those who already believe. This is not about, not about how to get saved. As Marcella told us, this is about how to behave once you're saved. We need to act like what God's declared us to be. And so uh, as we go through it, we, we'll, we'll avoid that critique of, well, what about faith? Well, there's an assumption of faith here. Yeah, this is taking the rules of faith and giving practical life illustration to them. Um, Tony Evans says it's, uh, it's what practical Christianity looks like. It's about living out your faith in everyday situ situations with everyday people and doing it victoriously. It's taking the, the things that are commanded, taught, uh, instructed, and, and putting them in user-friendly terms. Taking it, taking it out of the weeds, taking it out of the, 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 the difficulties of, uh, of uh, spiritual language or rhetorical arguments. and just James just says it plainly. He gets right to the point a whole lot. Um, one of the things I appreciated that uh, it, it was another statement from Tony Evans. It says, the book of James says, stop whining and keep going. I like that. Uh, far too many of us whine about what we can't do, what our limitations are, what our frustrations are, what our obstacles are, what, our, uh, what the spiritual strongholds are. And we whine a whole lot. Actually, we whine more than we pray. Can I get an amen from the... Yeah, I do in my life. I caught myself doing that this morning. I was whining about having to take my dogs out on the leash. I was complaining about it again tonight with this, these folks. Um, we whine a whole lot more than, than we pray. You know, and uh, need to be thankful. 
So I turned my whining this morning into, into praise of Thanksgiving. And uh, it made me feel better. I was still up at 6 o'clock having to walk the dogs, but I was doing it with a little bit better attitude once I started praising. Yes. We're God's children, and we act like our kids act to us. <laughs> so absolutely, it's a, it's a good way to look at it. Um, another, another statement, quit fighting and fussing and submit to God. So as we go through the book of James, we're going to find all kinds of life lessons, all kinds of ups and downs, all kinds of goods and bads. Chapter 1 is going to start off with the, with the quit whining part. Life's difficult. That's one thing I really appreciate about the book of James is he starts there. Uh, far too often, I think we give the example of uh, sharing the gospel that life's going to be easy or life's going to be good or we're not going to have struggles. And that is not what God teaches and James just jumps right into that. So, if y'all are ready, any other introductory things you want? If y'all are ready, we'll jump into God's Word, which has power. All right. James chapter 1, the introduction. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to one. To the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. All right, so in the introduction, again, probably speaking from Jerusalem to those in the greater Jerusalem, uh, Judea area, Palestine. Uh, he says to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. We don't know the specifics of uh, where the abroad is. The, we know the letter was traveled and taken all through Asia Minor and to all the churches Paul was planting. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, in some of the some of the statements, some of the some of the things they deal with, um, but primarily writing out of Jerusalem, probably to the what we would call the county or the region around, but to the twelve tribes as they're being spread out. This is after the Acts. Uh, I forget my chapters now. Uh, dispersion that happens uh, um, when the when the church begins to be uh, um, persecuted. Uh, Paul. What is that? Chapter 6, 7 in the book of Acts 8, somewhere right in there. And the church begins to disperse. Chapter 8, I think, actually. Um, and, and so James is written during that time period, uh, a lot of persecution, but also to the church itself. What do you need to do? So, again, that back to the foundation. Then we get into good stuff, what I call the good stuff, I guess. Verse 2. Actually, we'll do uh, 2 through 4, and then we'll. we'll, we'll We'll look, talk about those. It says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Consider it a great joy. So what do we consider joy? What is joy? Happiness. That's probably the most common definition we get. And we know there's a little bit of a difference, but it's probably the best way we can express it in our language. But we know it's different than just happiness, don't we? So what do we need to add to happiness to define joy? Peace. Contentment. I think those are two great words that I would have that I would have wanted added in. Because it goes beyond the expression of happiness to oftentimes something that's more inner. Because with, you can still have joy when the world's nuts, can't you? And when it's a choice. If you have Jesus, you can. And it is, absolutely. It's a choice. I'm trying, I'm trying to think of a good way to, 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 to illustrate the, the choice aspect. Because I think you're exactly right. Um... Well, this morning I got to walk my dogs. I wasn't very happy. Bo woke me up at 6 o'clock. He wanted to go for a walk. I had to get dressed. I didn't get to make my coffee till I got back. And, you know, it was at least 15 or 20 minutes later. And by then, you know, I'm already grumpy. I had to make a choice. Am I going to be mad? Or am I going to be happy? I was happy it wasn't raining. Joy began to come, began to come back to me when I started praying uh, Thanksgivings. And I became joyful because I made a choice. 
So I think it is. I, th I, th I think we have to wake up in the morning or, or go through the day and choose what we're going to focus on. If we focus on the Lord, as, as was said a moment ago, we've got to have the Lord in this. If we focus on the Lord and we choose Him, that inner peace and contentment will come. And out of that inner peace and contentment will, will be an expression of happiness that I think there's probably more to it than just that, but encompasses this idea of joy. So when he says consider it all joy, that starts out pretty good, doesn't it? And then it falls off the edge of the map here. My brothers and sisters, um, again, in, in, in God's word, not just the men here. This is, this is the, the, the church family. Uh, the scriptures open up the world to our ladies, uh, unlike other, other uh, uh, historical books or works or times in history. God's doing something different and unique. Uh, so brothers and sisters, consider it all joy when you experience various trials. Now, why do you have to go there? Now, walking my dogs really wasn't a trial. So I, uh, let me just get, tell you, I, I know that wasn't a trial. What is a trial? Fighting cancer. What else? <laughs> Waiting for a double lung transplant and being the next on the list and not being able to pass the qualifying test and having to be put back on the list, down on it, and wait again. I can't remember why. Did you have an infection, a fever, or something that time? Oh, the first lungs weren't viable. Okay. So she had to go back on the list and wait for a second opportunity and... Yeah, that's definitely a trial. I remember Harold Sudarth when he was waiting on a kidney transplant and having to go through chemo several times. Or not chemo, what do they call that when they take the dialysis several times a week. Um, waiting on, you know, there, there was a trial there where you could very easily just say, I give up. But you're not supposed to give up. We'll get to that part in a minute. Polly? So we've been talking about the physical trials, but maybe, maybe we should focus more on the faith trials when your faith is challenged. we got a lot of that going on in our world right now. I mean, we've in our country, uh, just in the last bit, I don't want to, decades probably, we've been moving in the direction of worldview. Um, going away from a Christian worldview to a secular worldview. And now we're not going away from, it, it's there. And it's more and more stuff you see in government and other places. And, and our faith is going to be challenged more and more. So it can be challenged at that high level. But it can also be challenged on a very personal level, can't it? As you go through life and you see things that need to be changed or need to be different. Or God challenges you. Anybody got, anybody got anger issues? My hand the only one up? Okay. Um, yeah, it's something I've had to struggle with most of my life. I get angry. Uh, I mostly have it under control. Um... It's very rare that I lose my temper now. Uh, it does happen. Um, I hold my breath a lot. Not till I pass out, but I do have to hold my breath a lot. It helps for me. And, and everybody who struggles with anger has different techniques they learn, they teach themselves to get over it. It's something you got to work on. You don't give up. But it's a trial. But there are spiritual trials. There's other sins. Anger is not the only one that, that may be a trial for you. Yeah, the, 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 the physical persecutions of Christians, even to the point of death, and a, a trial of their faith. So, so to, uh, to stick with the persecution side, Again, probably James, a, a, at least a primary point, if not the primary point of James here. Because think about the time period. To the 12 tribes who are dispersed. Why are they dispersed? Persecution. So the trials that, that, uh, that he talks about here when he says consider it all joy. Um, Paul talks similarly, doesn't he? About his trials that he went through. And he went through legal trials, right? Got thrown in jail. And what did he do? He had joy in the midst of it. 
uh, and he found a place to, be, to, 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 to place that joy. Consider it a great joy when you suffer trials or experience trials. Um, and he says various here. Lots of different kinds of trials. Not on one. So, so we've got the idea of trials. We've got the idea of joy. What do, why, do we, why do we consider it joy when we have trials? Because. We get a because there. You know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. I want to move to testing now. The testing of your faith. What's the purpose of a test? Okay, it could be to make you stronger. Absolutely. Sit in here. Make sure you know it. It's going to bring us to the perseverance. In school, they test you to make sure you know it. Uh, I, I had a professor, I've probably shared this before, because one of my one of my better stories from college. He wrote the book. Anybody else take a professor who wrote the book? He had a sign reading that he didn't have to read because he wrote the book. And on his test, he would include things like chapter titles and footnotes. He wanted to make sure you read it from the introduction to the very end, including the footnotes. Why? He wanted you to read what he took the time to write, whether it mattered or not. He wanted to know that you knew what he knew. Tests produce stress, don't they? And we all re respond differently to stress. And so how are you going to react when you're tested? God's people should react different than those who aren't God's people. When we re react to stress, we ought to be bringing God glory, consider it all joy. Very good. Tests reveal not just what you know, but strengths and weaknesses. And we need to know where we're strong. We need to know where we're weak. Streng uh, strengths and weaknesses is not good and bad in and of themselves, are they? They're important because where we're weak, we need to know, know how to either get help uh, to improve our abilities to become stronger. Or to, uh, from a management perspective, we always uh, we, we were taught yet you hire to your weaknesses. So if you point out strengths and weaknesses, you can hire somebody to take over your weaknesses or to help you there to, to, to firm that up. In your strengths, you probably don't need any extra help, but what you can do then is help somebody else out of your strengths. So if you've got a good strong back and legs and you want to help somebody mow this week that's uh, uh, in, in the nursing home, we can help you practice your strengths. You can share that with somebody else. But we're dealing primarily here with spiritual side of things, right? Strengths and weaknesses. So we, we're going to be tested. So we consider it joy when we're tried because it's a test. Tests aren't bad. Tests are good. It shows you the progress you're making. It gives you, uh, what do they call that in the medical field where they set uh, stages where you do tests periodically? There's a name for it. Oh, well. Baseline. Bingo, got the nurse. <laughs> got, got the paramedic. You got to have a baseline. So um, I was talking to a guy the other day who, who was telling about blood pressure. He, he had had to go to the hospital um, because he had, he had an extremely high blood pressure. And they were worried about it. They were worried about a stroke. And uh, so he, he, they, they ended up sending him home, got his blood pressure in control. But his blood pressure was still high, and they wanted him to go to the doctor. But there was a baseline. His baseline, his normal blood pressure was always at the very top of the normal level. So it wasn't high compared to the last 50 years of his life. But it was high compared to somebody who's on the lower end of the averages. If you don't know the baseline, you don't know how you're, how, you, how you're doing. You don't know if you're improving, if you're declining. You don't know where you are. You don't know how you measure up. So you need tests. God's constantly testing us in all kinds of ways throughout our lives. In the practical and in the spiritual. And we need to be thankful for those tests. Because the tests of your faith produce... Now we're to it. Perseverance or endurance. We've got to persevere to get uh, build up endurance. Um, I've got a friend who's an endurance athlete. 
we're not. I ran cross country. I ran five five uh, k, a little over three miles. Uh, a long workout was ten miles. I never did more than ten. An average workout would have been five miles. My friends run in fifty and hundred mile races, maybe even more than that. I don't. I, I, endurance. If you stop short, I mean, marathons, what, 26 or 23, 26 something? These are like double marathons that these endurance guys are doing. It's nuts. They're crazy. They're soldiers, they're taught to endure. You can't give up because there's a mission. And, and, and stopping short of the end does not result in the reward. So a soldier... It's got to get to the battlefield. Got to get to the new headquarters. Got to get the message delivered. If he stops short, he hasn't endured. An athlete, they don't, can't win a race unless they complete the race. Got to endure. Paul talks about that. Um, in our spiritual journey, what do we have to do when we have trials and temptations, or, or trials here, of many kinds? We got to endure. Why? Because the reward's at the end of the endurance. You know the hardest part for me with God and trials and endurance? It's usually a race with the blindfold. He's the only one who knows where the end is. You, you, you've either said it or you know somebody who has. I wish God didn't trust me so much. Because he says he won't ever give you more than you can handle. But every time you think you've got all you can handle, he puts another rock on. I mean, Josh, Josh and Lindsay going through that right now as we pray for Caleb. You know, every time we think we're, we're there, a, a, a slowdown happens or a new prayer request comes up and, and we got to hit it again. But God's faithful. But man, we'd like to know where the end is, wouldn't we? Because we know what the end is. The end is God's healing. The, end's a, the end is God's glory. But getting there is not an easy journey. Keep on keeping on. We've got to endure to the end. Wouldn't it be nice if God just showed you the whole roadmap of your life from the very beginning? Maybe. Then maybe it wouldn't be as much fun, right? I mean, a lot of us would try to take shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to, to, to holiness, are there? You've got to go through the journey. The journey's the trials that provide the testing, that produces endurance, and endurance has its full effect. It brings maturity. As Christians, our goal should be should be to be mature, right? If this, and I accept completely that this is James, the brother of Jesus, but think about him telling other believers to be mature in their faith. This is the guy who thought Jesus was crazy at one point in his life, as the siblings come up to Jesus and and you know, hey, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's out of his head. Come on, Jesus, come with us. No. Now all of a sudden he's traveled that, that road a little bit further and began to mature in his faith and is a leader. And he's telling us now the journey's worth it. We got to mature. We got to get beyond the pettiness. We got to get beyond the, the, the simple frustrations of life and, and begin to see God's got a bigger plan. Well, what's God's plan? To reveal himself, to save the lost, to sanctify the saved. We're a part of that. We should become mature and complete. This last part, I haven't got there yet. I haven't got complete yet either, but lacking nothing. Anybody lacking nothing yet? Now, in the general sense, the answer should be no. Or, you know, in the specific sense, sense, the answer should be no. What about the general sense, though? Is anybody lacking nothing? Then we could all raise our hands, couldn't we? If we're in Christ Jesus, we're lacking the ability to stay holy. But we are already completely holy, aren't we? So we really aren't lacking anything. What part of the Holy Spirit in your life are you missing? If you're in Christ. Now remember we're talking about Christians here. So in Christ Jesus. What part of the Holy Spirit are you missing in your life? Nothing. He is complete. Therefore he is complete in your life. So you're lacking nothing. You just may not be accessing all that's available. 
Ah, I, that is actually probably the greatest wisdom we're going to get tonight. What part of me is he lacking? That, is, that, that may be the best question we can ask. What am I holding back from God or from the Spirit of God working in and through me? Because he's lacking nothing. And honestly, we're lacking nothing because it's all there for us to access. Anybody got one of these smartphones? Oh, we got one that doesn't. We'll get him there. He, he's carrying my favorite phone of all time. He's got the old flip phone. Um, my phone can do a whole lot more than I can do. My ignorance does not mean my phone is lacking. My inability to send you a message or to figure out how to, how to do whatever it is I'm trying to do doesn't mean my phone's lacking. My phone's a lot smarter than I am in terms of using all of its usefulness. But I can watch videos and I can learn and I can be, have tutorials and I can have people show me things. My wife showed me something a couple of years ago that changed my life on the iPhone. You know that space button on your text messages? If you keep your finger on it, your little uh, cursor will start to blink and you can move it all over the screen. You don't have to try to find your spot on that itty bitty screen and, and touch just the right spot for that character to get where you need it to to hit backspace. You hold the space button and you can just move it around like a mouse. It's the coolest thing ever. Smartphone dumb user. But it wasn't lacking the ability. I was lacking the knowledge. So what is the Holy Spirit lacking in or what are you know what part are we holding back from God's Spirit being able to be made manifest in us? Complete, mature, complete, lacking nothing. We're always going to struggle with what we need to improve on. We're we're human, we're made out of flesh. Until we get to heaven, we're going to have struggles. But God has created us in such a way that we can find joy even in the struggles. It's a mindset. It comes back to what Jason said. It, 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 we have to choose to be joy-filled. We have to choose to endure. And it's not easy some days to choose to endure. I remember when Marcella first come home from the hospital or come back to church following her lung transplant. She was taking more pills than I eat food every day. I don't know how she did it. But she had to endure to stay alive. I think sometimes if we would consider our spiritual walk as important as our physical walk, we'd be a whole lot better off. Because we're willing to do stuff like that to live. But are we willing to do stuff like that to know God personally? To know Him in all of His holiness? It's a struggle. All right. Questions, thoughts, other comments. We're going to move forward. I think I'll get one more section in. We're going to do verses 5 through 8. It says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Who gives, uh, uh, I'm trying, uh, lost, my, lost my flow there. Let me start over. Now any of you who lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubting, doubter is like the surging sea, surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Being double minded and unstable in all of his ways. Alright. So we just got told that we should endure to become mature and complete and lacking nothing. And then he says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Ah, now if any of you lacks wisdom, it, it's that double-edged sword. We're, we're still human. We still have flesh. So we're not there yet. We have access. We just don't have ability. And so if any of you lacks wisdom, he's going to pick on us Ignorant people. Those of us who lack wisdom. But he's going to give us a solution. Well, let me, before I get to solution. What is wisdom? We're, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of word defining tonight. More than I typically do. 
just kind of jumped out at me this week. What is wisdom? <laughs> Being mature enough to know that you don't know everything. That is wisdom. What is wisdom? Allison. Knowledge with application. Anybody else? That's probably the standard definition we give most often. Um, it's more than just information. Yes. Experience. Wisdom comes out of experience. Uh, absolutely. So we're, we, we've grown in our experience through our trials. We've matured. And we lack nothing, but we're struggling with wisdom. So what do we do? <laughs> we get old. We get more experience. We ask God. Seems like I talk about this a lot, probably because it's one of my struggles. When do we ask God? After we fell a few times. When should we ask God? Before we fell a few times. It's kind of like uh, I, I, we're, we're in the move process. I, I loaded all the, all the old refrigerator stuff into a box, took it to the new house, and started unloading it in the refrigerator. I had wisdom about halfway through. I didn't have wisdom on the front end. I had wisdom about halfway through when I realized it's not all going to fit my way. And I said, Allison, let me carry boxes in and you do this. And she got it all set, situated and everything fit and it's all just fine. If we ask on the front end, we don't have to redo things on the back end. It's a whole lot easier not to sin than to correct the consequences of sin. Marcella? <laughs> the, the, the prayer of Lord help me through the day and help me not to sin is easy while you're still in the bed then you get out of the bed then you stub your toe and God gives you an opportunity to express your holiness <laughs> um, and never mind I'm not going to go there let's leave that toe alone be joyful because you still have a toe and God reminded you you have it when you kick that thing all that pain went through. Wisdom. Back to wisdom. Um, before I get sidetracked on too many of those. Um, if, you have, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God. You should ask God before, not after. But it's better to ask after than not to ask at all. Ask God. Seek God. Um, he's the provider of wisdom. What does Proverbs say in, in Proverbs 1? Oh, let's flip back there because I'm going to get it wrong. Psalms and Proverbs. It's just a whole bunch of Psalms to get through to get there. Um, for learning and wisdom, uh, for learning wisdom and discipline, for understanding and insightful sayings, for the receiving of prudent instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity, for teaching shrewdness, to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to the young man. Um, wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. But in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge applied becomes wisdom. So it's, it's really what that whole first proverb is about, is getting there and seeking God for that truth. Larry? Yep. What happens when you have an abundance that you want to get rid of? Let's just say you got a bag of rocks and you want to get rid of them. What happens when a young kid comes up and asks you for a rock? You give him with you give him with what? Abundance generously and ungrudgingly. You give it to him, don't you? What happens when you got life wisdom in a particular area? 
let's just say you've had a struggle in your life, you name it, not out loud, just name it, and you've overcome that struggle and you've learned from it, and a proper pride in that aspect that God's brought you through it, not an arrogant pride, but a proper holy pride, and somebody asks you for your advice in that area of expertise, what do you do? You share it abundantly, generously, graciously, because you're thankful God brought you through your experience and now you're able to use it to help somebody else. Our God in heaven, is he lacking anything or does he have abundantly everything? What does uh, Ephesians uh, 3.21 tell us? What's God got? Oh, now we got to flip over to Ephesians. No. Actually, it's 20. I, 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 was, I was a verse off. Now to him who is able to do what? Above and beyond all that we ask or think according to his power that works in us. God's got it all. To him who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's able. He's willing. So when we ask for what God already wants to give us. What he's already promised to give us. When we in an honesty and integrity and in holiness. Ask God for wisdom. What's he going to do for us? Going to give it to us generously. Without holding back. Why? Because he's got it abundantly. And he always gives what he wants to give. He wants to grow us. He wants to, to disciple us. He wants us to be there. He, so he says if we ask God. He'll give ungrudgingly and generously. And it will be given. Wisdom will be given. When you pray according to God's will. You get God's will. The problem is oftentimes we pray not knowing God's will. And then we wonder why we don't get what we ask for. And the simple answer is just this. It's not his will. Sometimes we beg him long enough, he'll give us what we ask for anyway, and it may not be for our best benefit. We see that scripturally happens. Verse 6, but when you ask for wisdom, ask in faith without doubting. So when Jesus says, ask in my name, it will be given unto you. Ephesians applies. This verse applies. They go together. Ask in faith without doubting. We have to ask it in Jesus' name. Because he's the giver. Um, we have to ask. And we're asking for wisdom now. Remember we're asking for God's will. For God's understanding. For God's knowledge. For God's understanding of application. For the doubter. Uh, it's like the surging sea. Driven and tossed by the winds. If you doubt. You may not receive. This is the faith prayer for the Christian. If you tell the mountain to move, but you don't believe the mountain to move, guess what? The mountain won't move. Say, well, I've been praying and I have faith and I believe. I had a, I had a, a, a classmate in seminary. His name was Justin. He was a uh, 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 several, cerebral palsy um, victim. And he walked on crutches. And he, he tells his story about as a young man going to the crusades to be healed. Why would they always tell him when his CP wasn't healed at the end of the crusade? Didn't have enough faith. Today he goes around the country preaching against the faith healers because it wasn't his lack of faith. Today he could probably tell you why he wasn't healed. And it wasn't because of a lack of faith. Why do you think he wasn't healed? Because through endurance he matured in the faith and now God uses that to teach others the gospel. God's given him the grace every day to get out of bed and to continue the journey and to do things he was told he'd never be able to do. Why? For the glory of the kingdom. For the glory of the Father. And so we have to ask according to his will. The problem is we don't know how long that trial lasts. How long that road is to get to the end of it. I wish I had better news. The only news I can give you for sure is this. It ends at death. And then we get heaven. Where it's perfect. But in this life. Until the trial is actually over. I can't tell you when the trial ends. 
Because there may be another curve in the road. There may be another uh, uh, you know, pothole along the way. We don't know until we're looking backwards on it and we're giving God glory for it. Now in the midst of it, we can be like Job and we can say, hey, I don't know when this is going to end, God, but I'm not going to turn my back on you. What happened when Job's friend said, curse, uh, curse, the Lord, or, uh, curse the Lord and die. There we go. Job said, no. He giveth, he taketh away. I forget what comes next. There's, I should know that one. My brain's freezing on me tonight. Lord, give us and the Lord take us away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That was t too tough to get to. <laughs> I need more sleep. Um, all right. So ask without doubting. In faith. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Uh, being double-minded and unstable in his ways. If you have something precious. A strand of, uh, of expensive pearls or diamonds or whatever. Do you give them to your two-year-old? No. Why? Because they're going to teeth on them. And they're going to pull them apart. And they're going to flush them down the toilet. And they're going to toss them outside. They're going to bury them and dig them up. <laughs> up their nose and in their ear. We have somebody in here that does that with peanuts. <laughs> Uh, when they were little. Uh, you just, God's not going to give his precious treasures to somebody that's not going to take care of them. He's not going to give his precious wisdom to somebody who's not going to use it wisely. Use it with maturity. Use it for the benefit of the kingdom. And so we have to ask with faith, with the right mind, not being double-minded. And we got to be willing to endure. That's the hard part of, of this chapter. Is we got to be willing to endure. If we're going to be holy. We've got to be willing to endure. Trials of various kinds. It will end in maturity. Absolutely. God will get us there. We have to persevere. But he will get us there. But I like what Paul said. I, I think that's got to be the best lesson of the night. Tim, if you're looking for a title or something on Facebook, that, that was probably it. I'm not sure how to say it in a, in a short, quippy kind of way. But we've got all of God's spirit that we need. The question is, what are we holding back from God? What have we not allowed Him to fully infiltrate in our life and our heart? Because that's the trial. That's the spiritual journey. That becoming complete part. I really like that. I'm going to probably keep using that. Got What is God missing from us? Because he's not missing anything. He's fully in us. He's given us all that we need. We got to learn to access it. Access him. He says if we ask in faith for wisdom. It will be granted to us. This all comes through these trials. That build maturity. They build holiness. They build uh, uh, character. <laughs> we take a suitcase with us to the altar when we sing I Surrender All. How many times have you left that suitcase at the altar? Some of us need a moving truck, don't we? Just unload it. Let God have it. It's hard. I get it. We're human. And the devil wants to remind us. You ever been trying to be holy and the devil brings something to your mind that either causes you to regret something from the past or think about something current that's causing sin? Um, for men, it's often, often visual stimulus. And we're like, we're trying to be holy. God's given us all the holy we need. We just got to access it. We got to stick to it. What's, uh, Job 31.1. You may not know this one. It's one of my favorite things I learned at, at, at youth camp over the years. This happened in Texas at one of the youth camps. Well, I think it was some of the boys had it written on their forehead or something or on their arm. They wrote Job 31.1. Allison told me. I think I don't think I saw it. I think I remember the story. I think Allison told me the story. But it's, it's stuck with me. It's my favorite camp thing. I, I made a covenant with my eyes not to sin against God. It's a struggle. But it's important. Why? Because God's given us everything we need. We just got to ask the wisdom giver for the wisdom 
to know how to do it. And I haven't learned this part yet, but I'm trying. Better to ask before you make the mistake than after. How many times can you cut a board to length if you cut it too short? <laughs> Jesus was a carpenter, but he was also God. He could do anything he wanted to do. I don't think he ever messed up to begin with, but if he did, he could just stretch the board. I can't do that. My boards are too short. I got to get a new board. Better to ask first than let God lead. Biggest problem in that is doing what God tells you. You got to be willing to take the advice or the wisdom that God's given. All right, out of time. Any questions? Any comments? We're going to pick on Marcella some more. Good. <laughs> That's a good one. I got to repeat that one. When Marcel was in the hospital with tubes everywhere, Paul said she had more tubes in her than an old TV set. I like that. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. We're talking about Marcella when she's in the hospital. It took her six people to get her from the operating room back to her to her bed, and Paul went to visit her in the hospital. All she could do was praise God. Sing and thank you, Lord. And when we'd call her and talk to her, she was always optimistic, always positive, and just thankful for these new lungs. Even when she was filled with pain and, you know, not able to go home, and then finally able to go home but couldn't leave the house, and taking bags full of pills every meal. And the pills were the meal. I mean, it was crazy. But she was always praising Jesus. And Paul said for him, that, that was a picture of the joy that we're talking about tonight. In the midst of the trial, she kept her head up, looking at Jesus and giving him glory. So, good. Thank you. And we've been blessed to use you as a blessing. <laughs> All right. Polly? Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge, Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Yeah, Proverbs, thank you. Yeah, that's why I have Wednesday night people, they help me. Especially when my brain's dead, which is most of the time, but more tonight than normal. All right, let me pray for us, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this crew who's here tonight. For those who'll be watching online, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge, but also the promise that if we're willing to endure the trials, that you will bless us. Remind us to ask for wisdom so that we know where to step, where to go, how to live, how to love. Help us to, to, to follow what you've taught us well, to know you and to make you known. Help us to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul and love others as you've loved us. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Keep us joyful and help us to share the good word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us tonight. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Normal schedules and uh, uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. So uh, should have some website updates uh, by the end of the week uh, for VBS. So if you're looking for information, or registration should be up by the end of the week. Thanks. Have a great night. We'll see you next. Uh, see you Sunday, if not before.